Hello, my name is Darcy, and this is my YouTube channel, Fostering Cats. Today, I'm going to talk to you about how to clean your house after you've had panleukopenia or Khaleesi virus. In this video, I talk about feline panleukopenia, also known as FPV or panleuk, and Khaleesi virus, also known as FCV or Khaleesi. But I primarily focus on panleukopenia because of the two, it is the hardier virus. The suggestions in this video work for ringworm as well as pretty much anything else your cat or kitten may have contracted. This is the gold standard of cleaning. Some of the references I include are for canine parvovirus because they are very similar. In fact, they believe that canine parvovirus mutated from feline panleukopenia in the 1970s. And finally, all the scientific information in here is sourced. If I don't specifically state what source it's from, it's because it's something that's considered common knowledge, meaning that it's located in multiple sources. And as always, I encourage you to do your own research and don't believe anything you find on social media blindly. Do your own research and confirm the information. Now let's begin. So let's talk about how feline Khaleesi virus is transmitted. It's transmitted through direct contact with the saliva, nasal mucus, and eye discharge of infected cats, and through aerosol droplets that spread when cats sneeze. Cats typically shed the virus for about two to three weeks after infection, but some cats become long-term carriers and continue to shed the virus on and off for months. Khaleesi is a hardy virus that survives on surfaces for up to a month in certain environments. How long it's gonna survive in the environment Basically depends a lot on the humidity level, temperature, and sunlight. Khaleesi also has an incubation period of about two weeks from the last known exposure. Now let's talk about how feline panleukopenia is transmitted. Now this virus is transmitted primarily by the fecal oral route, including through exposure to objects, clothing, hands, contaminated with the virus from feces. Panleuk is very durable and can persist in the environment for months or even years unless inactivated by an infected disinfectant. Cats may shed the virus for two to three days before clinical signs are observed and up to six weeks after infection, although shedding that long is not common. It has an incubation period of two weeks from the last known exposure. Now, a couple of things that I wanna make extremely clear about what I've just talked about is understanding Fomite transmission, which is how panluke is transmitted quite frequently. A fomite refers to inanimate objects that can carry and spread disease and infectious agents. Fomites can also be called passive vectors. Humans that handle infected cats can inadvertently transfer the virus to new animals. Think of panleukopenia as a sticky virus. Imagine the kitten was covered in honey. You touch the kitten and get the honey on your hands and clothing. When you touch other surfaces, including other cats, the stickiness or the virus is transferred. If you've ever stepped in something sticky, you know how easy it is to transfer that stickiness to other areas. Pan Luke works that way. So if you're in a shelter environment and you're holding cats next to your clothing, like in this photo, you could potentially be getting the virus on your clothing and spreading it to other cats in the shelter and in your home. A cat can shed either of these viruses without showing symptoms. Like I said, they can be shedding panluke two days before they show symptoms. If you touch the cat, the virus could remain on your clothes and infect another cat. You need to consider where the cat or kitten was in the days before it got sick as well as where it was when it started to show symptoms. Okay, now there's a few things you need to understand before I begin, and let's start with some terms. Cleaning means physically removing dirt and impurities from surfaces or objects by washing with soap or detergent. Surface or objects must be cleaned prior to applying a disinfectant for efficacy. Disinfectants do not work properly through the physical debris that must first be removed before cleaning. Okay, disinfecting. Disinfecting, it means using chemicals or other means to kill germs on surfaces or objects. Sanitizing usually refers to both cleaning and disinfecting together. It's the use sanitize to lower the number of germs on surfaces or objects. It requires both. And 
a lot of times people talk about cleaning and they mean sanitizing. In fact, I do that in the title of this video because I wanted people to find it and more people would be looking for cleaning than sanitizing. So the other two terms that are really crucial is dilution ratio. This is how much chemical to water is needed for the chemical to kill a virus. For example, a 110 dilution ratio means one part chemical to 10 parts water. And the other term you need to understand is contact time. Contact time is the amount of time a surface should remain wet with the chemical to kill the virus. That means if you're out in a sunny day and you spray something on and it has a 10 minute contact time, but because of the sun, it dries in five minutes, you got to do it again. That is spray it down. It's got to remain wet for 10 minutes. The contact time is also usually determined by the dilution ratio. Some chemicals have longer or shorter contact times depending on how much of chemical is in the water. So you need to make sure you understand the contact time is referring to the dilution ratio, not the chemical itself. Okay, now let's talk about what kills Panluc and Khaleesi virus. First, bleach, sodium hypochlorite. For either Panluc or Khaleesi, uh, you need a 132 solution of 5% bleach. That means one half cup bleach to one gallon water with a 10 minute contact time. Now, not all bleach is the same. If you go to the store and you buy, you know, and you see bleach, you gotta look at the label because some bleach is 5% and some is 7.5% sodium hypochlorite. If you have a higher percentage, you can use less bleach. And the other part is splashless bleach should not be used for disinfecting. Don't use it. In fact, when you, when you go to the store and you look at bleach, next time you go to the store, look at the bleach bottles. Some bottles are labeled splashless and some are labeled disinfecting. Grab the disinfecting bottle. Now, bleach is inactivated by organic material and offers limited penetration on pore surfaces. So it's not the best thing, but it does. it's very effective. It's, it's good on hard surfaces. It's good on surfaces that you've cleaned well. It also has a shelf life of about six months. That means if it's sitting in the bottle unopened, it only lasts for about six months. It loses about 20% of its effectiveness for each year it's stored. And over time, bleach naturally breaks down into salt and water, which does not kill panleukopenia or Khaleesi. Now, it can be stable for 30 days once diluted if, and only if, stored correctly in a light proof container. However, just make fresh each time because light rapidly inactivates it. It's not worth the five cents of you'll save on bleach to try and reuse it. Okay, now let's talk about accelerated hydrogen peroxide, also known as Excel or Rescue. The two names come from the fact that it changed names a few years ago from Excel to Rescue. Rescue has greater detergent properties and better activity in the face of organic matter contamination compared to bleach and related products. It can be used in carpet cleaners on contaminated carpets and furniture, but you should always check first to make sure it doesn't stain or cause color dilution. It has a 90 day shelf life once diluted. Contact time for it differs depending on the dilution used. Check the bottle, but according to current information, a 164 solution with a contact time of five minutes kills viruses. However, the University of Wisconsin recommends a 116, which is eight ounces to a gallon, with at least five minutes of wet contact time or a 132 dilution with at least 10 minutes of wet contact time. For items that are more contaminated or porous, use a stronger solution and a longer contact time. You can go even up to 15 minutes contact time. So I put a little dilution ratio chart together for you of the three dilution ratios that I've talked about here. So, so again, to just refresh your memory, the 132 dilution ratio is for bleach. For rescue, the instructions say 164 dilution ratio, but the University of Wisconsin recommends a 116 or 132 dilution ratio. 
This just includes how much you would need to include for each of these ratios. If you're mixing it for a 24 ounce spray bottle or you're mixing it with a quart of water or a gallon of water. Now there's a few other chemicals known to kill parvovirus. Uh, potassium peroxomonosulfate, uh, vircon or trifectant. I've used it. I'm, I'm not a big fan because it comes in like this powder form and so it's not as easy to like just make a little. Um, it has greater detergent properties and better activity in the face of organic materials and bleach. So it kind of works the same. It's on the same level as accelerated hydrogen peroxide and it can be used in carpet cleaning machines. These other two, calcium hypochlorite and sodium dichloro something something. I can't even say that word. These are both like in the same family as bleach. So they have the same disadvantage of bleach being inactivated by organic material and offering limited penetration on pore surfaces. Again, correct dilution and contact time is critical. Measure correctly. If you use too little, the chemical won't be effective. If you use too much, it can become corrosive and irritating to cats and people. And use a timer to calculate the contact time. It is okay to use a longer time as long as you make sure the surface remains wet for the minimum time. So it's, you know, for, for contact time, it's okay to spray it and leave it for 30 minutes. It's not like it's like, well, it's a, you know, 10 minute contact time and 15 minutes it comes back to life. But you do want to make sure that it stays wet during that 10 minute, 15 minute contact time um, because if it doesn't, it stops working. Uh, two other things I want to talk about is temperature. A temperature of 212 degrees Fahrenheit, 100 degrees Celsius, kills parvovirus within one to two minutes. Yes, this means boiling water. However, parvovirus can survive seven hours at 176 degrees Fahrenheit, 80 degrees Celsius and 72 hours at 132 degrees Fahrenheit or 56 uh, degrees Celsius. Khaleesi virus can survive a temperature of 129 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 54 degrees Celsius, for 8 to 18 minutes. So, if those of you who think that you can put something in the clothes dryer or the dishwasher to kill Pam Luke, unless you plan on doing that for three days, it's not going to work. You got to use a chemical or you got to use a higher temperature. So the average clothes dryer has a temperature of 125 to 135 degrees Fahrenheit. The average dishwasher has a temperature of 130 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's not hot enough. One thing to note is the University of Wisconsin Shelter Medicine article titled Parvovirus in a Home Environment states that steam temperatures need to be 75 degrees Celsius or 167 degrees Fahrenheit. However, I'm unable to find any studies that support this. And in a 1987 study by David McGavin, inactivation of canine parvovirus by disinfectants and heat states that the resistance of CPV to inactivation by heat depended on the temperature and the duration of heating. Boiling rapidly inactivated CPV, the virus was more resistant to lower temperatures, detected in a, Detectable infectivity remained uh, after 7 hours at 80 degrees Celsius and 72 hours at 56 degrees Celsius. Typically, if this was anything else, I would say, well, you know, newer information has come out, but I just don't believe that the temperature of steam and water, you know, and its ability to affect the parvovirus has changed that much since 1987. And since there is no study that has proven that a lower temperature will work immediately, I'm not going to include that. So FYI. Steam cleaners. Now I have a steam cleaner, love my steam cleaner, but you gotta be careful because not all steam cleaners are the same. You must use a steam cleaner that has a nozzle temperature of at least 212 degrees Fahrenheit, 100 degrees Celsius. Nozzle temperature is not the same as the heating temperature. And this is an image from uh, one of the, the steam cleaners that I recommend. And as you can see, it illustrates perfectly the idea of the nozzle temperature and distance from the nozzle, how it changed the temperature of steam. So as you can see, this one has a nozzle temperature of 275 degrees, but as it goes further across, you start to lose that temperature. 
check reviews and consider purchasing a digital thermometer to ensure the steam is hot enough. Usually, it's like on Amazon, if you look through the reviews, somebody has used a digital thermometer to test how hot it is, and you can get an idea. And I've, re- I've found three that do have a nozzle temperature hot enough, and I've included those links in the description. Now I need to cover a few things that do not kill Khaleesi virus or in Panluke. Ammonium disinfectants, like triple two and Rocal, Despite their label claims, they've been proven ineffective against parvoviruses. Freezing temperatures. Panluc can survive winter temps. Khaleesi virus has survived 14 days at 4 degrees Celsius. Lysol, as well as most of your household cleaners. Now, phenol-based Lysol will work on Khaleesi virus, but it's not recommended to be used around cats. Clothes dryers and dishwashers. Sunlight and UV light. Now I did some research trying to include UV light because there has been some anecdotal suggestions that it could work against parvoviruses, but I couldn't find enough evidence on the strength and time required, and the equipment seemed to be very expensive, so for that reason, at this time, I can't recommend it. Alcohol. It's moderately effective against Khaleesi virus, but it is not effective against ringworm or parvoviruses. And so that means hand sanitizer also doesn't work. I can't tell you how many times I've seen somebody handle a kitten that could be pan loop positive and then watch them walk over to use hand sanitizer and I have to stop them and tell them that doesn't work. You need to go wash your hands and mechanically remove the viruses. And finally, waiting short periods. Look, you've either killed the viruses or you didn't. Waiting 24 hours, a week, two weeks, six months, doesn't work. It's only effective if you wait a year or more. Before you start the whole sanitizing process, sit down and list everywhere the cat and kitten was in the three days before it started to show symptoms and everywhere it has been since getting sick. Think of transportation, crates, rooms, etc. Then list everywhere you've been after touching the cat. Think about what rooms in your house you've been. Don't forget about everything you were wearing, including coats, shoes, etc. Make a list of everything you're going to need and gather it to where you're going to be using it. You can't stop in the middle of this. All right, let's talk about some of the equipment I use to both clean and sanitize. Scrub brushes. Go to the dollar store, get a large variety. Just get one of everything so you have them. Then find a long-handled scrub brush. I found this one on Amazon. It's about $15, and it is wonderful. It saves your back. And remember, you can use it on walls. You can use it on crates. You can use it on floors. A mop with plenty of extra mop heads because because if you're using it to clean, you're going to have to throw that mop head away before you can use it to sanitize. Um, Buckets. Lots of buckets. Garden sprayer. If you're using bleach as one of your things to disinfect, a garden sprayer works really well. Also, if you're using rescue, you can use the garden sprayer. But for rescue, something that works a little better is what's called a rescue foaming trigger sprayer. This attaches to a 32 ounce bottle and creates a foam rather than a mist. And the foam stays wet longer so your contact time is extended. A wet dry vacuum. This is called a bucket head vacuum. It fits on top of a five gallon bucket and I use it for both cleaning and disinfecting. During the cleaning process, you know, you always have like, if I'm doing crate, I have like lots of extra liquid, I can suction up the liquid. And then this five gallon bucket, if I don't feel like I can sanitize it well, I can toss it out and use a different one. And then I use the same thing for disinfecting. And because I'm using this to disinfect, the entire, you know, machinery is gonna be disinfected as I'm cleaning. But it's only $30, so if you don't feel like you've been able to disinfect it, you can toss it out. Measuring cups. You've got to remember to get that dilution ratio perfect. Scrubs and garden shoes. I have several pairs of scrubs. I wear them both during the quarantine period for kittens as well as when I'm cleaning. It's great because I can throw them on over my clothes and protect my clothes when I'm in there and still be able to handle kittens as I see fit. 
and then I can take them off and leave them in that area so that I'm not contaminating the rest of my house. A nice pair of plastic shoes that you can then dump into a bucket of bleach to disinfect them is great too. And that way you don't have to try to disinfect your regular shoes. Heavy duty trash bags, you're gonna need a couple of them. And then your disinfectant and your water. Okay, first step, toss. Consider what you wanna to toss and replace and what you wanna keep. Do a cost analysis for items that takes into account your labor. It is not worth spending an hour to clean a $5 litter box. However, it is worth spending an hour to clean a $100 crate. Double bag anything that leaves the area to prevent spreading the virus. Toss anything that can be inexpensively replaced or is heavily soiled or scratched. Things I routinely throw, litter boxes, plastic food dishes, bedding, small toys, all cardboard. Things I don't throw out, metal dishes, crates, things I can soak, and things I can cover with paint. Cat trees are difficult and will be discussed in a later video. So the second step is cleaning. When you're cleaning, everything is still contaminated. Your cleaning equipment, your clothes, your shoes, even the water can contain the virus. Do not clean outside in an area that can't be thoroughly disinfected. So if you take the crate into the backyard and you're hosing it down, you're hosing the virus into the ground and it will still be in the ground for the next year. Don't leave the area you are cleaning without disinfecting your clothes and shoes. Make sure you have everything you need before you begin. You're going to sanitize or toss the equipment you use to clean before removing it from the area. Now, what I like to use to clean, Dawn. I pretty much use Dawn to clean everything in my foster room. I can't think of anything it can't be used on. Walls, floors, it just works well because it's designed to get rid of food and grease and, and it's cheap and it's safe. So Dawn, water, scrub brushes, and a wet dry vac. Now just one final reminder, if an item isn't clean, the disinfectants won't be effective. You need to make sure you get rid of all of the dirt and grime and feces and whatever is on a surface so that the disinfectants can reach the virus. Okay, now to disinfect. Use a garden sprayer. The surface must remain thoroughly wet. For rescue, consider getting, it, as I said, a foaming trigger that creates a foam that remain wet longer. Do it at least three times with two different methods. Do it when you're fresh. Don't do all three times the same day. Make sure the surface remains wet for the length of the contact time. If it dries too soon, respray it. It's fine if it dries after the contact time. And it's fine to rinse with water once you are done sanitizing. Now remember, Everything you or the cat or kitten touched has to be sanitized. In each location, you kind of have to think about what happened in that room. In the room where the cat was housed or where the cat has been, you pretty much ha everything has to be sanitized. For every other room, you must sanitize anything that you may have touched. Any surface, doorknobs, light switches, railings, floors, windows, faucets, doors, drawers, bed frame, chairs, etc. Don't forget about things like your keys, your phone, TV channel changer, your refrigerator, your can opener. And don't forget the pathway to different locations from the foster area to the bathroom, etc. In your car, your door handles, your steering wheel, radio, trunk, as well as surfaces around the crate and you. Take a sprayer. Walk around your house and systematically spray and sanitize everything. Just kind of walk slowly through the area and, and think about where your hands might have been, where your, your feet are. Start in one corner of each room and walk around the room and then and just make, take the time to make sure everything is sprayed. Do this three times. Take your time. And the reason you're doing it three times is not because the first time doesn't work, it's because the first time you might have missed something. So if you do it three different times, the chances are you're gonna get everything are much better. Thank you for watching this video. Here are my sources that I used for this video. I do have a part two planned. 
if not already released, where I talk about the hard to clean objects such as cat trees, carpet, furniture, wood, wood floors, lawns, and a bunch of other things. But I just couldn't include all that information here. So keep a watch out for it. And as always, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel. Have a joyous day.